Hi, this is Matt with State of Flex here with a series review for Obi-Wan Kenobi, the latest Disney Plus Star Wars TV show. Um, it's My review here is going to start non-spoiler, but that's going to be a very slim amount of time before we move into the spoiler-laden material. I will tell you when it is safe to jump off if you've not completed the show. This is going to be the full six episode arc that I am talking about. Um, getting into the non-spoiler ter uh, territory, uh, I loved this show. This is the best thing that Disney has uh, touched Star Wars uh, wide with the sole exception of The Last Jedi. I'm a big fan of that and if you uh, are turned off by that you can hop off at this point. I have a whole uh, series of reviews. Check my channel for all my Star Wars reviews. Uh, you can see my deep thoughts on The Last Jedi uh, and the other Disney Star Wars material. This, I think, stands almost shoulder to shoulder with The Last Jedi. Its qualities are so good. It hits heights that Star Wars I didn't know was honestly capable of hitting anymore. Um, the performances in this are so stunningly strong. Ewan McGregor was always the highlight of the prequel trilogy. He excels far beyond that. And the intimacy that we get to spend with this character and how much Ewan brings to it is just jaw-dropping. Um, the utilization of the Darth Vader character and um, the journey that we're taking with him is really quite compelling. And Hayden Christensen, who does reprise his role, um, really does a great job with the scenes that he is given. I don't know how often he is in the uh, Vader suit, but I believe there are certainly times when he is, he has a very distinct physicality to him, and uh, what he brings to Vader in costume is very believable and very palpable, um, and something that I uh, admired. Uh, Moses Ingram uh, got a lot of hate early on uh, on the internet from a very bigoted sect of the populace, and um, she is stunning, especially in episode 5. Uh, the performance she gives in that is the greatest Star Wars performance we have seen from any TV show. Uh, and stands shoulder to shoulder with the great performances from the feature films. Your Ewan McGregor's in the prequel uh, trilogy, particularly that of uh, Revenge of the Sith. Your Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford in um, uh, Star Wars, and uh, Mark Hamill, especially in The Last Jedi, uh, and Alec Guinness. I would throw her name alongside these greats. Um, uh, and Ian McDermott, he's always great and fun uh, in those movies. I want to throw his name in there too, because uh, his he hits the perfect balance of ham and stuff. But that's a Star Wars conversation, not an Obi Wan conversation. We're focusing on Obi Wan. Um, so performances, the um, way the story is written and unfolds is very compelling and very structured specifically once you notice what that structure is. I will touch on that a little more in my um, uh, spoiler talk, but um, the episodes are kind of modeled after other Star Wars entities that you've already seen uh, in similar epi uh, episodic uh, stances. And uh, that is uh, quite... Uh, uh, quite lovely to see. The writing is just great, but it's really the performances that elevate the good writing to great experience. The look of the show, by and large, is great. Um, the action is, uh, for the most part, shot very well. I will discuss where I have issues with that. Um, and this gives us um, the most immersive Star Wars um, televised experience that I've ever had, far more than any episode of The Clone Wars, which is a show that I like, or The Mandalorian, which is a show that is on TV and is fine. Um, this is the heights that Star Wars is capable of being and it always has been. This is also the Star Wars that I think people wanted back when they'd heard in 
the 70s and 80s and early 90s that George Lucas had always envisioned uh, a six-part uh, or 12-part or nine-part varying stories series of movie or a trilogy of trilogies and one day he would do prequels. This is the story that I think a lot of people thought would have been like your episode three. If episode uh, three so I, it, my, I think what people expected versus what they got is they thought that the certain best episodes of the Clone Wars would have been Star Wars Episode One. They th uh, thought that uh, Revenge of the Sith would have been Star Wars uh, Episode Two, and they I think they felt like Obi Wan here probably would have been the Star Wars Episode Three that they had in their head, um, and. Uh, they are not wrong to want that because what's delivered is exceptional. Um, Deborah Chow is the uh, one who spearheaded, uh, spearheaded the show. She was showrunner. She is the director of all six episodes and had have a heavy influence over it. Uh, was really the right person to do so. I can't wait to see what she does next, be it in this uh, universe or beyond it. Um, she is a very uh, talented uh, filmmaker, and I can't wait to see uh, what form of artistry she can bring, uh, especially in telling very personal, um, powerful stories. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else that I can discuss in a non-spoiler uh, kind of way? Um, and uh, the thing of it is, is I don't think I can. Um, I'm going to move now into the uh, spoiler territory. So if you want to hop off at this time, uh, now's the time to do so. But I say it with this caveat. This is Star Wars. You kind of already know where this story goes. This being a prequel. And um, yeah, so like the spoilers that are here are going to be spoilers for your enjoyment of this. Um, but your enjoyment of this is kind of reliant on what came before and what comes next within the narrative of the story, so you kind of already know the trajectory this goes. So the story that, or the, the spoilers that I'm going to give are going to be uh, something that, even though you might not see coming, you kind of always should have seen coming. Um, but now's the time to hop off. Spoilers uh, ahead, and I'm going to go episode by episode. Episode one of this uh, show uh, reconnects us with Obi-Wan. We get to see what he's been up to ten years, uh, for the past ten years, and um, what we see is a broken man. Uh, and the feel that I got was very similar to the Luke we get in The Last Jedi, and that is um, uh, powerful to see, and I think helps actually strengthen the, the film The Last Jedi, a film that I already think is uh, incredibly powerful. This kind of actually, like, uh, sturdies those pillars uh, that hold that thing into uh, the being of quality that it is. Um, Obi-Wan is incredibly well um, written from the perspective of the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi. I like that this nomadic man, Ben, is just trying to live by his day by day, and uh, I honestly would have watched a whole episode of him just doing that, and that's kind of what I was expecting. Um, we're early on introduced to the Inquisitors. I have not really watched much of Rebels. I've seen a, a handful of episodes here and there, including the Obi-Wan one, and, um, and what I... I was kind of initially disappointed with the Inquisitors. I didn't like them, I don't necessarily need them, but they were a compelling force and I thought that that was going to be the ultimate showdown the show was going to give us because I didn't know how much of Darth Vader we were going to get outside of we knew that Hayden Christensen had been um, approached to reprise the role as both Anakin and Vader. Um, so I was um, incredibly surprised when about ten minutes into that first episode, the show deviates and takes us to Alderaan, a planet we've not spent any time on, um, or almost any time on. And uh, we are introduced to a young Princess Leia. And 
like, you look at that actress and you, you don't really buy that that's a young Princess Leia. She doesn't look particularly like uh, Carrie Fisher. But it's the way she embodies the character. It's her performance that sells it. And she is so good. She is the highlight that is not Ewan McGregor. She is incredible, especially in that first episode. Um, when she, you see her in like the diplomatic party talking down to this other uh, kid um, in a way that is so Leia. It's, it just is. Um, you, you believe that that is her and you can hear Carrie Fisher saying those words alongside her. Uh, I feel like she was spirited into that child for that child to uh, present that performance. Uh, and she's great, but you not only get hints of Princess Leia, you get the hints of uh, Padme. And it's it's believable that she is uh, like the tether between those two characters. And, um, uh, or performers, I should say, I guess, because she is one of those characters. Um, but she's, uh, she is great. Um, and I like in that scene that you get a hint that she is accessing her Force ability, her Force ability to read people. That's one of the things that you kind of always have gotten with the uh, character of Princess Leia that nobody in the franchise really has. And I feel like that is one of the gifts that she has accessed with the Force completely unknowingly. Um, and that scene when she's talking to the boy and uh, dispelling everything about that boy uh, is, is just so good. Um, it, it shows her capability of the Force, her capability as a, a young girl, and as a future diplomat. Uh, it, it is great. Um, I could sing the praises of that girl all day. That said, um, I was hit with a disappointment as the show continued. And that disappointment was, the character of Princess Leia, as written in 1977, or really 1974, 5, 6, um, was that, uh, uh, especially when uh, Lucas passed the script to Gloria Katz to um, punch up some of Leia's dialogue, the idea of Princess Leia was to subvert the um, damsel in distress plotline. She is clearly the beautiful princess and the damsel. Star Wars was written as a subversion, uh, or a, a tip of the cap to these great um, star, uh, great epics uh, throughout history, uh, and and great romances that we've gotten uh, in literature. He wanted to do a filmic version of that, but he wanted to do it with a modern spin and subvert the general expectations. Everybody's expecting the damsel in distress. Nobody's expecting the damsel to be the one to save her uh, would-be saviors. She is the antithesis of the damsel in distress trope. So it was so disheartening to see, 50 years later, almost, that character uh, being utilized as a damsel in distress. Um, that was a big disappointment for me. But that was really the only complaint I had about that first episode. I thought how um, we kept getting uh, flashbacks from the previous uh, episodic Star Wars films and Obi-Wan's um, PTSD over what uh, and guilt over what happened with Anakin and seeing Anakin even young at the uh, helm of the um, the uh, what is it the N1 fighter or whatever from Episode One um, as a young boy and then seeing Luke on the uh, the little hut uh, pretending to be the uh, pilot hell he even could have been pretending to be a pod racer. Um, and you just see the visual of that and how evocative it is of each other. You believe that Luke is the son of Anakin. Um, or the, like, there's a connection between Jake Lloyd and that kid. Um, and uh, I love that. And I love the utilization of um, Uncle Owen. Um, and uh, Uncle Owen has a great scene-stealing moment in that episode where he uh, goes up against the Inquisitor and stuff. Um, that whole first episode is really quite stunning, and I was pumped and ready for episode two. Episode two hits, and the uh, thing, I again, I was not a huge fan of the whole idea of the damsel in distress thing. Um, f flee from Red Hot Chili Peppers kidnaps uh, Leia, and um, 
then Bail Organa has already reached out and brought uh, uh, old Ben into the fold as the Jedi that he once was, and Obi-Wan is back to try to save uh, the girl. And so he ventures off to this planet that's uh, looks like a cross between Canto Bight uh, and uh, Coruscant, like the dark underbelly of Coruscant. Um, I'm, I can't remember what the name of that planet was, but the, visually it's like tethering those two uh, concepts together. And uh, uh, you get a great uh, scene with uh, Camille Nanjiani, who is purported to be, er, 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 like, um, selling himself as a Jedi, uh, which Obi-Wan knows is bunk, and I thought it was just going to be a cameo. I was pleased to see that character uh, linger on. Um, anyway, Obi-Wan does his, like, detective work, and it feels uh, very... Uh, similar to how he behaved in episode two, and I think this is a good time to discuss uh, how these stories are structured. Episode one is very much a uh, reflection of uh, Star Wars episode one. It's a call to action, and um, uh, you're spending some time with this uh, young uh, it, with this Jedi who is trying to get pulled into this uh, larger story, um, which ends up being uh, uh, Padme's child, Leia. Um, then you have uh, this episode, episode two of the show, is very similar to uh, Attack of the Clones, so much so that dude even runs into a clone, and that was a really sad... Uh, uh, moment seeing uh, where the clones have uh, gone to, the fact that they got uh, uh, Tomoa to uh, reprise his role as the clone was really kind of cool. Um, especially since you know that was the, the kind of clone that was uh, uh, killing the Jedi. Um, and so you have uh, uh, this where Obi-Wan is doing his detective work uh, on the planet and it, it seems very similar to uh, Attack of the Clones. Um, and then each of the other episodes I'll talk about when we get to them about how they kind of reflect uh, the reflections of the episodes as, as we go. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about from episode one I loved it was the opening scene taking you uh, right to the moment that Order 66 happened and you're following these younglings who are trying to band together um, uh, as the siege on the Jedi Temple happens. Um, that becomes important pretty soon. Episode 2 ends with something that was just stunning to me, and that was um, the uh, moment that Obi-Wan learns Vader is still around, that Anakin is still alive. There's a look of shock and worry and total PTSD that you in, Im, imbues into the screen. You feel everything that he is feeling as a character, and it is so powerful. It hurt to watch. It was the last thing I watched that night right before going to bed, and I couldn't sleep the whole rest of the night. He gave me uh, his PTSD. If he gets a nomination for any one of these episodes. I hope it's for that episode in that moment because he, Ewan, gave the greatest performance of his career in that moment and there wasn't a single line of dialogue from him. He purely does it through the emotion within his eyes, how he is breathing, and everything about that scene is just golden. Um, episode three. Uh, has the return of Darth Vader, and you get the uh, threat of Vader as we kind of always wanted to see him in action. Um, we were not really able to see a great Vader in episodes 4, 5, and 6 the way that they can utilize the technology now, uh, and we didn't get Vader in suit until the last scene of uh, Revenge of the Sith. What I think a lot of people wanted from those prequels was more Vader action like you get in the last scene of Rogue One. And this show gives you plenty of that. And Episode 3 is where you really get it. This is where you have Anakin and Obi-Wan 
number uh, fight number two. This is the scene that is very reflective. The, so episode three is reflective of obviously Revenge of the Sith so much so that it ends over a pit of fire where one of them is uh, burning in it at the hands of the other, um, and uh, that is a powerful scene. That whole combat is great. The way that scene was shot and the choreography of uh, stunt work, I think, was, uh, left a little to be desired, but I think they were saving it for later episodes, and we will address them shortly. Um, but uh, the return of Vader in that and the uh, voice work of, uh, of James Earl Jones was incredible. I don't know if they brought him back or if they used AI technology. I've seen that um, reports saying that they used a, uh, AI technology. If I had a guess, I would imagine they brought James Earl Jones back and used that AI technology that you see in the credits to um, clean it up and make it sound like he did in Episode 4 more than he sounded like in Rogue One. Um, but uh, that's just me and my pure speculation. We're also introduced to another uh, character, uh, uh, would-be Imperial kind of character that isn't, and is in fact um, uh, trying to help Obi-Wan on his uh, journey, and she's a uh, pretty great character, uh, one that I really enjoyed, um, though we don't really get to see a ton of her, uh, and that will... Uh, come talking to later. But yeah, episode three is very, very strong. It is an emotional experience watching Obi-Wan and Vader reconnect uh, for the first time on screen since 2015. Uh, or, sorry, 2005. Um, episode four, I think, is the weakest of the set. Uh, it is similar to uh, episode four, New Hope, in that you have um, Obi-Wan infiltrating uh, an Imperial craft and trying to um, uh, like sneak around and uh, make it so that the good guys can escape. Essentially that is the same uh, reflection that you're getting uh, within that episode uh, to the traditional filmic episodic episodes. Um, uh, that one I don't have a, a ton to say. I there was moments I liked. It was startling to see some of the uh, the Jedi frozen in the amber and stuff like that, um, and um, the further character work you got with both Riva and um, and with uh, um, uh, the. the I can, her character name is sli uh, slipping me, but the one who befriends uh, Obi-Wan. Um, uh, I liked where we got more of her character and, and whatnot. But uh, all of that was, as I say, the, that one has some action scenes that are quite, uh, quite good. The digital effects in that episode are kind of weak, especially the scene where Obi-Wan is uh, breaking the glass and the, the water comes rushing in at the stormtroopers and stuff like that. Um, it looked the most rushed and it seemed like the most irrelevant episode of the bunch. Uh, like you probably could have woven that into the narratives of the episodes beside it. Uh, but I digress. Uh, episode 5 is where it's at. Episode 5 is the best episode of the show. This is the show, much like Empire Strikes Back, where true revelations are given. That is what happens here. We are given revelation to the main villain of the story, the main villain being Reva. Um, we find out that Reva has a plan of her own. She, and they pretty much telegraphed this from the opening scene of the first episode, so it, it was not a huge surprise, but at the same time, uh, emotionally at work. Uh, you find out that she was one of those uh, young Padawans that was there during the raid, and uh, Hayden Christensen returns in all of his Hayden Christensen glory uh, to execute Order 66, and he slaughters those Padawans, leaving her uh, left for dead. She had to bury herself and cover herself in the bodies of the other Jedi just to survive, and infiltrated the 
Empire so that she could work up the ranks and stab Vader in the back just like she just like he did to all the Jedi that is her goal um, but along the way she has been corrupted uh, and she also blames Obi-Wan for what happened with Anakin and uh, the episode you keep giving getting flashbacks where uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin are sparring and how it reflects the nature of both of their characters and how Obi-Wan says there are alternatives to fighting. You can win this war without uh, lifting a hand, something that comes into play in The Last Jedi and Return of the Jedi, but, you know, people want to be all upset that that's not my Luke. Anyway, that's another story. Watch my review for that. Um, that whole episode, every moment that you're given with Hayden Christensen and Ewan McGregor is stunningly perfect. I cannot express how great it was to see them back in their characters. They didn't lose an, like a minute in that rapport and um, yeah, I think this really helps redeem Hayden's uh, reputation as a performer because he's I've always felt been very good. Watch my reviews of episodes two and three. I am in firm defense of Hayden Christensen mainly because of uh, uh, Shattered Glass being one of my all-time favorite films, and he gives a goddamn Oscar-worthy performance in that. Um, he is, and has always been a great actor who's been overlooked because he didn't have the material in those Star Wars films to support his capabilities. Here he does. That uh, episodes 5 and 6 were co-written by Oscar winner Andrew Stanton, who made uh, films such as Wally -E and... Uh, uh, the original Toy Story and uh, Inside Out. This is a very well-rounded, uh, hey, I think he also wrote Toy Story 3, um, well-rounded, incredibly well, uh, uh, well-meaning screenplay artist uh, working within Pixar. Uh, he is a gifted filmmaker in his own right, and he knows how to tell an emotional story purely perfect, and you get that in these last two episodes. Um, and, uh, so yeah, Hayden is great. My only complaint with any of the Hayden and, um, Ewan scenes in the flashbacks is they did nothing to de-age them, which, you know what, is fine. These dudes have, uh, aged remarkably well, um, but, uh, it is noticeable that he doesn't look like 18 anymore. Um, and he has some age lines, particularly in the, like, mouth line and a little bit under the eyes, but don't we all? Um, and if you're paying attention to how they look rather than how they're performing, like, I don't know what's wrong with you. Uh, it's, that, that's not important. Uh, what is important is the dramatic weight that this episode holds. It is triggering, it is jarring, especially since, um, the story that, uh, Reva gives and, and whatnot in this episode is not all that dissimilar from the stories we were hearing, uh, come out of Texas during that school shooting just weeks prior. Um, this is a topical episode, and it's uh, a painful episode because you're watching a dark re uh, portion of our reality reflected through uh, the lens of science fiction, which is when science fiction can be at its greatest. Uh, and it's not lost on me that episode 5 of this show is the best episode of this show, this, the best episode of any Star Wars uh, television property ever. I'm firm in that uh, belief. Um, and, uh, I think stands shoulder to shoulder with, like, episodes 4, 5, and, in my opinion, 8 of the original series, uh, of Star Wars films, uh, as being the best in its quality. This makes my top 5 list of best Star Wars things ever. That's how good episode 5 is. Uh, every performance works when people start dying, you feel the weight of the loss. Uh, the character who uh, befriends um, Obi-Wan uh, dies in the fall, and uh, uh, you feel the weight of loss with that. Um, I liked how uh, just everything to do with uh, oh, uh, Obi-Wan's 
portrayal in that, uh, and his guilt at Vader and the fear of confronting him a second time, or a third time, I guess. Um, and then uh, Reva trying to execute her plan on Vader, finding out that Vader already knew, and he was just utilizing her and using her until she was of no more use, and he let her go. And this is a perfect example of people on the internet needing to shut the fuck up until the story is complete. People were losing their goddamn minds because the Inquisitor, uh, Inquisitor um, who was killed in a, pre a previous episode, this breaks canon because that Inquisitor is in, uh, in Rebels, which takes place later. Yeah! Uh, the story wasn't over. Wait till the story is done before you start bitching. Because when you do that, you break the trajectory of the story. Just read Episode 9, Duel of the Fates, versus watching Episode 9, Rise of Skywalker. You're bitching about The Last Jedi before the story was even complete has its answers, and you would have been probably pretty satisfied with them had you gotten the end of the story. You didn't even wait for the end of the story to even come and complained about it so loudly that they changed the trajectory of the narrative until you got the bastardization of uh, a corporate mess that is Rise of Skywalker. Fan film, the movie, I like to call it, and it's fucking awful. Um, and no, and in no way reflective of how our major Star Wars saga should have ended. Um, check out my review for that. Uh, sorry for that impassioned display. Anyway, episode five is great, um, and uh, I I could sing the praises about that all day. But we needed to talk about the final episode, episode six, Return of the Jedi. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, uh, yeah, episode six, um, does, uh, give you yet another confrontation, um, of Obi-Wan and Vader. You have Vader's suit getting impaired, the same breathing, uh, all of this is kind of reflective of Return of the Jedi, and then you have the hopeful conclusion of what is to come, which, uh, is also how Return of the Jedi ends. Um, but this episode, I think, is largely great. There are some things that I think don't necessarily work. I thought Reva's narrative, which was really compelling in the previous episode, seems kind of running fast and loose. Like, they needed another good hour or half hour with that storyline to really make it soar, and they didn't. Um, I'm also kind of disappointed. I wanted her to die, not because of any performance-related issue or my feelings on the character. I just feel like... Star Wars keeps introducing these characters in um, prequel storylines that they are they fall so in love with that they don't want to kill them, but they also never come back in any meaningful way in later stories, and it becomes kind of like problematic. This is my issue with uh, Ahsoka Tano, um, and uh, yeah, I have my own thoughts on her. You can check out my Clone Wars review for that, um, at least a little bit anyway. Uh, I only did the Clone Wars movie. Um, but anyway, um, this seems to be another uh, layer on that, because um, I, I did really like the Reva character, but it's also at a certain point okay to let a character die, even a compelling one, even a very great one. Um, and um, that that is uh, that was one thing that kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, that said, I really liked how... Um, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru are utilized in this story, and how they are, um, uh, they have a battle plan ready, and, uh, Aunt Beru, who always seemed like the passive quiet type, was the one that was really orchestrating a, a stand, and she, uh, it makes you want to see what, uh, she and he did when the, uh, stormtroopers came in to try to find the droids in episode four because I believe they probably made a hell of a stand against them, uh, if this is any indication. Um, and, uh, so yeah, you have them. I haven't sung the praises of Jimmy Smits. Jimmy Smits has been great in the episodes that he's been in. He has a great moment at the end of this, but he's a, such a fantastic actor, and he brings so, so much gravitas and life to that character, who on page is just diplomat, guy does diplomat things, is father of important character. 
um, but he has an innate like ability, and you can believe his um, his uh, richness of character just because he exudes that himself as a performer. Um, that's kind of all I have to say about him. This story is really Obi-Wan versus Vader part two, and the final confrontation between Obi-Wan and Vader is chilling, and it broke my heart when uh, Obi-Wan learns how to uh, take him down is by destroying the chest piece and then cleaves the thing, the, the part of the helmet, and you see the dark reflection of um, Anakin inside Vader. And, um, it's a brilliant vi visual symbolism, and it's lit amazingly. You have the blue of Obi-Wan's light as Anakin is talking, and then Anakin says that, uh, he, uh, Vader killed Anakin, which, uh, kind of lifts up, um, what Obi-Wan says about, uh, who killed, uh, Luke's father. Um, and supports that beautifully. Um, but when Anakin, uh, when Obi, sorry, when Vader takes responsibility for his own undoing and the murder of Anakin Skywalker, and then you see his uh, lightsaber start overtaking the light that is uh, reflected on Anakin's skin, is beautiful visual storytelling as well. Um, when Obi-Wan says goodbye uh, to Anakin and says, my friend is truly dead, uh, evocative of a line that Luke says in Return of the Jedi, um, uh, uh, paraphrased almost exactly, uh, if not directly quoted, um, and then so, uh, when Obi-Wan just leaves uh, Vader there and he says goodbye Darth, uh, that is uh, a powerful moment, and one of my favorite things is that uh, uh, he kept calling Vader Darth in uh, A New Hope. It just made me laugh because they're all Darths, so it just made it kind of uh, is something that I always uh, found kind of silly. Um, but at the same time, uh, he doesn't want to acknowledge who Vader was. He is uh, not any part of Anakin. Uh, he's just a bad guy. He's just a Darth. And I like uh, that about Obi-Wan in that moment. Um, I'm going to try to talk about the ending without uh, breaking, but I was talking about it with my wife and I just started crying again. Um, the ending scene is just beautiful of, um, of Obi-Wan saying goodbye. Early on in the episode he has to say bye to Leia and you think it's the last time that he's ever going to see her until, you know, he sees her for a brief second and then dies. Um, in episode four. Um, but uh, he, at the end of the show, goes back and says a proper goodbye to Leia. And he gives her a great big hug and he tells her that she is the beautiful reflection of her two parents that she sadly never got to meet but he got to know and tells her that she's uh, beautiful and intelligent and brave just like uh, Leia and Fierce and um, I can't remember the exact quote but it, it, it summed up everything about uh, his adoration of this child and his friends uh, and it is the most beautiful moment. I was crying like a baby. Uh, it, it was absolutely stunningly well uh, performed, well, uh, well written, uh, well shot, and I loved it. Uh, I haven't talked much about uh, Leia since that first episode. In episode two, you get to spend more time with Leia, and you see how she is very similar to uh, Padme, and you can see, uh, see the parallels there, and so much so that Obi Wan kind of uh, like starts. Um, it tells her that he reminds her of somebody from the past. I know some people online think it's a uh, character from the Clone Wars or whatever, but it's not. I, I promise you when they were writing in this, they were thinking about uh, uh, Padme. And this all but proves that, this final scene. Um, and uh, it's my favorite, ep uh, favorite moment of the whole uh, episode of the whole show. Uh, his saying goodbye to uh, 
Leia, and it breaks my heart that those characters never got to reconnect again. Um, and uh, I love it. And if you go back and re-listen to uh, the Carrie Fisher, like, General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. If you listen to that through to completion, it doesn't necessarily break canon that uh, she doesn't talk about anything directly involved with her own life. She's trying to sound uh, the whole help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope, resonates really loudly because he helped her and provided her with a hope in this story. And so that part, when she says that line in A New Hope, I feel like is her speaking directly to him. Um, so that worked for me. I, I, it slightly breaks canon, but no more so than like, um, tell me about your mother, I never knew her. And then she, uh, Leia's just like, uh, just images, really. Um, <laughs> she doesn't remember her mother. Uh, anyway, so, uh, I digress. They go back to, um, uh, they go back to Tatooine, and Owen allows, uh, Obi-Wan to meet Luke, and you get the beautiful, hello there. Um, it's amazing, beautifully performed. I choked up at, uh, him meeting Luke, uh, even though you don't even get to really meet Luke. Um, that worked for me, that was great. Uh, and then the last scene of the show, you get a glimpse of uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, the return of Qui-Gon. And that was uh, something that uh, moved me, but I think was wasted, because he should have been given a scene. Um, I liked that he, what's implied with that, that he's always been there. He's just waiting to see how long it would take him to see. Um, but. I think they could have had a better, stronger pass at that, to really sell that he's always there, he's always part of the Force, and always a part of Obi-Wan's life, um, and he always will be. Uh, they could have written that stronger, but it worked enough for me. Um, what worked better was the Palpatine scene, where Palpatine is trying to train uh, Vader, which you never really see many of those scenes, uh, if any, really, where he's like, you need to let go. You're tethered to that uh, old man is what's uh, going to lead to your downfall. Um, uh, you have a whole empire to rule. Don't fixate on this, uh, on the past kind of thing. And uh, uh, the uh, way that's performed, and Ian McDermott is awesome. Um, that, that scene was great. I was hoping we were gonna get an Emperor scene, I was happy that we got one. I was hoping we would get, uh, a Qui-Gon scene, I was happy we got one. I wanted a lot more from that, but I digress. I was also curious to see if we were gonna see, like, Yoda or something like that in some capacity, but, uh, we did not, and I guess that's fine. Um, Final thoughts on the show, this is a spectacular show that unfortunately uses uh, a damsel in the d distress narrative to get the ball rolling, which uh, I didn't think was necessary, but um, uh, really worked for me because Ewan McGregor is fantastic, and if this is the last we get of Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan Kenobi, then uh, man, he went out on high, way higher than uh, Revenge of the Sith, which I think is a four-star movie and one of my top five favorite Star Wars films. Um, so, uh, saying that this uh, eclipsed that is saying a lot. Um, I think the show in general, if I were to include this in my ranking of the uh, feature films and stuff like that, if you were to pretend this is just a really long five-hour Star Wars movie, this would probably be in my, at number four, uh, like behind episodes uh, four, five, eight, uh, then you'd probably get this. And um, I, I can sing no higher praise than that. Uh, those other three episodes that I just referred to formed my being. Um, and that's, uh, that's saying a lot that this uh, lives up to that level of quality. Um, so yeah. I've been talking a lot about Obi-Wan, but this was a huge series to talk about, and one I've been dying to talk about for weeks at this point, honestly. <coughs> um, 
Let me know what you think about the show. I think it's great. I, you see some a-holes that are just really loud on the internet, most of which are probably bots that are attacking the show due to its uh, uh, political affiliations. It's Star Wars, yo. Like, it's, it's right there in the title. Uh, th this franchise has always been political. If you've a had a problem with that, you have to have had a problem with it back in 1977 when it was created. This was a reflection of the uh, Nixon administration uh, trying to take grander control of uh, a uh, democracy in or a republic and watching democracy fall. Um, and uh, every era of Star Wars has been in response to or rebuttal of uh, the political arena of the time. You have had the original trilogy which were commenting on the Nixon administration, you had the um, the uh, prequel trilogy which uh, Lucas maintained he was still referring to the Nixon administration, however you can't help but notice certain parallels with the Bush administration of the time, and then you have uh, the um, the current era of Disney that was very much in response to uh, kind of the Trumpisms of uh, uh, right-wing uh, politics of the current era. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, and uh, if you have a problem with that, you probably shouldn't be watching Star Wars. I'm sure there's some fun uh, other uh, franchise you can jump a hold of. I, I hear the Rambo movies uh, uh, get better as they go. I thought they got worse as they went, but you know, that's just me. Um, but yeah, Star Wars uh, has always been political. If you've had that problem, you've probably been having it for a while. Anyway, Obi-Wan is great. Uh, it is fantastic. Let me know what you think about the show in the comments down below. What was your favorite episode? What was your favorite scene? Who was your favorite character? And what was your favorite cameo? Drop them down. Uh, I did make a promise to uh, one of my commenters on the last video that I uploaded that I was going to make these nice and concise uh, moving forward because my videos are too long. I think I missed the ball on this one. Uh, but I'll work on that for the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye.